So uh, I, I will share some thoughts about uh, whether reproducibility and uh, transparency uh, has been improving uh, over the last uh, several years since we started discussing that we do have a problem and we need to do something about it and whether biases are decreasing and uh, how does that picture look across different scientific fields? Because obviously science is a conglomerate of lots of different activities and lots of different types of investigation in very different disciplines. Some uh, preemptive comments that uh, I, I always like to make is that uh, the quest for dealing with the reproducibility crisis should not be seen as some sort of anti-science agenda that uh, we're trying to discredit science. Science is the best thing that ha can happen to humans, but science depends on trust. And trust depends on transparency and trust is enhanced by reproducibility. And, and basically the question is how much trust can we have and can we do things better? Are things getting better? Recently, we looked at uh, uh, indicators of openness and transparency and reproducibility across the entire open access uh, PubMed central uh, collection of millions of articles. And uh, this is uh, plotting on a global scale, the percentage of publications from each country in the last 30 years from 1990 to 2020 that are sharing raw data. And you see that there's uh, pretty much lots of darkness around the world. Uh, practically in no country is there any meaningful minority of uh, papers that are being shared in the raw data uh, level, uh, maybe with the exception actually of a few African countries. Um, and the reason for that is that these countries are very poor. They cannot do much research on their own. However, there is international interest and there are some projects that are very well coordinated and that are done there and that do have a clause to, to share their data. But otherwise, as you see, um, most, not most, all of the high income countries, uh, they have very, very low late rates of data sharing. <coughs> How about uh, registering protocols? Uh, of course, uh, registering protocols cannot happen for all types of research. There's a lot of research that is entirely exploratory and has no protocol, it is iterative, um, but, there's also a lot of research that uh, has protocols that are pre-specified or should be pre-specified. Uh, everything, for example, in the clinical trials arena and many other types of work. Uh, again, in the last 30 years, if you look at these millions of papers, there's very little being shared, actually even less in terms of uh, registering protocols uh, across uh, the entire scientific literature in PubMed Central and around the world. At the same time, there is increasing interest in discussing reproducibility. Uh, this is uh, some text mining exercise that uh, we did a few years ago, and uh, the, the pattern has continued since then uh, across all 21 major fields of science. Over the years, there is far more frequent mention of uh, uh, words like re results reproducibility or reproducibility of results or, or related terms. Um, and Practically every scientific field has been going through some soul searching about it. Uh, the topic is discussed. Uh, some fields are doing more and others are doing less. And I'll show you some breakdown in some uh, other slides down the road. There's inherent differences in reproducibility across scientific fields. Uh, there's differences in the degree of determinism, in the signal to measurement error ratio, in the complexity of designs and measurement tools, in the closeness of fit between the hypothesis and the experimental design and data, the statistical and analytic methods that are used to test hypotheses, the typical heterogeneity of experimental results, whether there is a culture of replication, uh, transparency and accumulating knowledge, or some fields have had that for a long time, others have discovered that more recently, others have not discovered that to a large extent yet. The criteria, for truth claims, uh, uh, whether they're even statistical or not. And if they're statistical, are we talking about p-values of uh, 0.05 or less or 0.005 uh, or 10 to the minus eight, uh, for example, in genetics uh, uh, or some other criteria like Bayesian or false discovery rates. And finally, the purposes to which findings will be put and the consequences of false conclusions, because the uh, 
different disciplines in research, they may have different orientations on whether they're more curiosity oriented, uh, kind of basic uh, science, uh, blue sky uh, investigation versus uh, applied research, translational research that wants to make a difference in medicine. Many disciplines, they try to save lives. So eventually, do we save lives? And if we get it wrong, do we kill people? There's uh, different types of reproducibility. And these are the three major clusters uh, that uh, I have identified along with my colleagues at Metrics, uh, reproducibility of methods of results and of inferences. Reproducibility of methods uh, traditionally refers to the fine print section called methods in scientific papers. And uh, it's about understanding that method section along with whatever supplements are offered to make them more transparent and, and more understandable and more workable and then be able to put these methods into action. So if it's uh, an issue of a code of an algorithm, if you try to get it to work, does it work? Uh, can you even open the file? Can you get it to run? And uh, uh, if it's an experimental procedure, uh, can you tell what exactly was done and uh, how you can uh, make it work again if you want to make it work again? Reproducibility of methods, unfortunately, even though it is the first element and the most essential element for reproducibility, uh, is very weak. Uh, a few months ago, the reproducibility project on cancer biology was published in eLife, and uh, the investigators showed that out of the experiments that they had selected to reproduce, uh, published in top journals on cancer biology research, most of them they could just not get the methods to work. Uh, the methods were not possible to understand. Practically, uh, it was never that uh, just what was stated would be enough uh, for people to repeat the experiments. Then you have to reach out to the investigators to get clarifications for what they have published. Uh, and again, most of the time, the investigators did not respond or they uh, just offered minimal uh, advice uh, that was not sufficient and eventually some of them did. And by the end of the day, it was only a minority of experiments that someone could even try to, to reproduce again because the methods otherwise uh, were not possible to understand in sufficient granularity. Reproducibility of results means the ability to produce corroborating results in a new study having followed the same experimental method. So if, if you know what the methods are, or at least you guess uh, and can put them to work, then you do a new study and you try to see whether you get the same or similar or not the similar results. And here there can be a lot of debate of uh, what exactly that means, because we have the third component, which is the reproducibility of inferences, which is uh, making knowledge claims of similar strength from some study results. Uh, so people would look at the same reproducibility effort and some of them will say, oh yes, the initial study was reproduced and others would say, no, it's not really reproduced. It's clearly different. Others would say it is reproduced according to this set of rules, but it's not reproduced according to a different set of rules. Uh, to stick to the example of the reproducibility project cancer biology, the investigators of that reproducibility effort had seven different rules on defining what replication means, what successful replication means. And of course, these rules uh, arrived at somehow different results, uh, some of them more favorable and others less favorable for their replication rates. These seven rules are just a subset of a much larger number of rules that uh, can be specified or misspecified, uh, interpreted or misinterpreted in trying to understand whether something has been reproduced uh, in a new study or not. Over time, uh, we have seen very strong persistence of some research practices in statistical inference that uh, kind of uh, run the show in terms of how we try to decide whether some signal has been found or, or discovered or replicated. And the, the most prominent has been the use of p-values and null hypothesis significance testing and uh, uh, p-values of less than 0 0.05 have acquired some sort of uh, uh, sacrosanct uh, status in much of the literature. This is uh, an empirical assessment that uh, we performed along with David Chevalerias from the Institute of Complex Systems in Paris. Uh, and uh, uh, we looked at the entire 
uh, PubMed, uh, about uh, uh, 15 million abstracts by the time we run the analysis and uh, close to 1 million full text articles. And uh, practically p-values less than 0 0.05 were ubiquitous. Uh, if there were p-values used in an abstract, then 96% uh, of these abstracts would include some p-value that was less than 0 0.005. And if we had full text that used any p-values, again, 96% of the time, there would be some p-values that uh, had uh, less than 0 0.05. This has decreased slightly over the years. Uh, so we started with uh, something like 98%, both for abstracts and for full text in 1990, and by 2015, it has gone down to about 95%. I don't have more recent data, so I, I'm not sure whether that decline may have continued. If it has, it has probably been a very soft decline uh, at, uh, at best. Uh, we have run a number of empirical studies on more focused areas, and we see the same pattern, even with very recent papers, uh, even in papers published in um, leading journals and in very diverse uh, disciplines. So I suspect that it's still very, very, very high. Most studies also have uh, remained very small. Uh, these are some empirical data with uh, Dennis Sux from Cambridge, where we looked at neuroscience, psychology, and medicine, and uh, uh, looking at different journals. So we saw that uh, the typical sample size was very small. And uh, unless you assume that the effect sizes being pursued in these fields are huge, the power to detect them would be minimal. Uh, and there's no reason to believe that the, the signals would correspond to very large uh, effect sizes. Uh, when we looked at uh, the evolution of effect size over time in the field of neuroimaging in particular, and uh, these are uh, studies published in, in highly respectable journals like Nature Neuroscience, Journal of Neuroscience, Neuroimage, and Cerebral Cortex, uh, we saw that there is an improvement over time. Um, in 1990, the typical sample size was five or, or less, and it has gone up to about 25 by now. Uh, 25 is five times bigger. However, it is still pretty small if the effect sizes that we're pursuing are subtle or even moderate. Uh, so uh, some improvement, but still tremendous uh, lack of power, which results in both false negatives and false positives if we have just a tiny bit of bias, as we discuss in this paper in Nature Reviews Neuroscience, where we looked at the power distribution for studies done across very different fields in neuroscience, uh, ranging from basic science all the way to animal work and clinical trials. This is a completely different field, uh, economics, along with uh, Tom uh, Stanley and Christo Kuliagos. Uh, we have uh, ac accumulating uh, all the data from all meta-analysis published in economics. And this is from an early paper that we published five years ago looking at uh, uh, what these studies are and how big they are and what power they have to detect uh, typical effect sizes. In most topics, uh, there were hardly any well-powered studies. Uh, so we had 130 topics back then. We have repeated the analysis. We still see that in the vast majority of the economics literature, the studies are, are underpowered. So economics and neuroscience may seem to be very far apart, but they share the same problem in that regard. Some fields in the last uh, 10 years or, or, or so, they have uh, acquired uh, the ability to uh, collect very large data sets. Uh, sometimes uh, these data sets are being collected on their own without us doing anything. So electronic health uh, records uh, are, are being accumulated uh, while we sleep and I wake up in the morning and there's more of them to analyze. Uh, or uh, collections of data online uh, in uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, in the borderland of research and uh, private use. And, and of course, there's lots of excitement about what we could do with them. And the problem of small sample sizes, uh, of course, evaporates when you have uh, millions and, and billions of observations. Uh, some of them uh, have also started becoming very influential, for example, in public health decisions. But the problem with these data is that even though we have gained in, in sample, we have lost in quality. Most of these data are of, of amazingly 
unreliable quality. They have uh, biases that are sometimes very obvious and worse, uh, very often they're not even obvious uh, because uh, nobody really has uh, gone in the midst of these data to see how exactly they're collected and, and how uh, they have uh, been accumulating and how exactly the biases would operate. So a tremendous opportunity to learn, a tremendous opportunity to learn also about the biases and how to overcome the biases of these uh, data. Uh, it's, it's a new feature that uh, I think that many scientific fields uh, will be increasingly working with. Many fields have also started uh, uh, changing their research practices, uh, some of them uh, impressively so. Uh, genetics, I think, has been one of the most clear examples of a field that moved from a field that was entirely irreproducible to a field that is highly reproducible. So the, the paradigm in, in genetics, in, in genetic epidemiology, was that someone had to give a lot of thought to come up with uh, one or two genes and uh, a couple of variants in these genes that biologically they would make sense that they would be associated with some disease. Uh, so a lot of thinking about the biology and the process and mechanism was going into this. Then people would test these gene variants and they would write up association studies reports, what we call candidate association studies, published uh, uh, about uh, 50 to 100,000 of them over the years. Uh, and most of them were wrong based on what we know now. Uh, why? Uh, well, the field realized that we were not getting very far. We had new technological capacity to not look just a couple of variants, but look at the entire genome. We could do that in large scale. People realized that they had to join forces, that sample sizes were very small, that they had to run meta-analysis jointly of all the teams or multiple teams working in the same area on the same phenotype. And then when we did that, we could go back and see how many of our 50 to 100,000 papers that we had published in the past could be validated. And the replication rate was 1.2%. Uh, maybe it's a bit better because even these large studies would not have perfect power, but even if it's 5%, it means that anywhere from 95 to 99% of that literature that was published in the best journals, Nature Science, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, uh, the Pop Genetics journals was just completely wrong. Is the same pattern happening in other fields? Well, other fields, most of them have not had the same transformation as genetics, but most fields in biomedicine, especially in epidemiology, they have been operating in similar principles as genetics, candidine genetics had been operating. So people had to think about one or a few factors among uh, a space of multiple or sometimes not necessarily millions, as in the case of genetics, but thousands and also different types of specifications of these factors, and then run trying to uh, find associations with them. Increasingly, we have the ability to look at patterns of research when multiple studies are done on the same topic and they're summarized in meta-analysis. Meta-analysis has become very popular. I think that uh, when I started uh, publishing my first meta-analysis in the mid-1990s, it was seen as something pretty unusual. Currently, there's topics that there have been 50 meta-analyses on the same research question by different teams. Of course, redundant most of the time. We have lots of meta-analyses that allow us to look at the studies on the same question and see whether the pattern of the results is such that suggests that they may be compatible with some bias. Uh, for example, if we have 20 studies on the same question, we can ask, do small studies tend to have more prominent effect sizes compared to the larger studies. This is what we call a small study effect. Or do studies that appear in the gray literature as opposed to peer-reviewed literature have different effects, gray literature bias? Or do we see a decline effect? Do we see that early studies uh, show very prominent results, uh, very spectacular effects, and then as we do more studies, they go away? Do we see early extremes, what I have coined to be the Proteus phenomenon, uh, where you see a spectacular effect in the first study, then within one or two years or less, you have a window of opportunity to refute that effect. So you see a completely opposite result. And then the subsequent studies tend to be somewhere between these two extremes. Do we have citation bias? Do we see stronger effects in countries that, that uh, incentivize and pay and reward scientists to get extreme effects like 
you know, I think the U.S. pays more, but this has changed over the years. Now, China, for example, you can uh, get your salary to be 10 times bigger or 20 times bigger if you publish a paper in Nature uh, in, in that year. Uh, industry bias, uh, pressures to publish like country level policies, author productivity, author impact, mutual control, career level, gender and research integrity. All of these factors, we can look at whether they leave their hints in the pattern of the results of meta-analysis. And this is what we did along with uh, uh, Dan Finelli and Rodrigo Costas across meta-analysis in all 21 fields of science. We saw that most of the time we have hints of all these biases but these biases tend to be different in different disciplines. For example, uh, small study effects are very prominent in the social sciences. They're also prominent in the biomedical sciences, but they don't seem to be a big problem on average in physical sciences. And maybe this is not surprising because physical sciences, they, they have tons of data. And they have all these telescopes and, and all these uh, uh, large collaborative uh, structures that generate immense amounts of data. Um, decline effects, again, uh, very prominent in the social sciences, uh, uh, not so much in uh, biological sciences and, and so forth. And we can also look at the distribution of effect sizes. We, we can look at what are the effect sizes that are circulating in the literature and how do these change over time as we perform hopefully better or different research. Uh, this is an early effort uh, where we looked at 85,000 topics in medicine. And uh, literally, these are 85,000 meta-analysis. We looked at the effect sizes and their distribution. We asked how often, if you look at the entire Cochrane database that summarizes information on all medical interventions, how often do you see uh, an effect on death, decreasing death by fivefold, and seeing that at least uh, twice, and uh, with a p-value of less than 0.01, and with no major concerns about the quality of the evidence, uh, uh, you know, obvious bias. Out of 85,000 topics, we can see only one such example, uh, extracorporeal oxygenation for severe respiratory failure in newborns. Uh, so huge effects that are very well replicated and we're solid, clear, uh, sure about them are very, very uncommon. However, large effects seen incidentally are very common. If, if you ask how often do we see an odds ratio more than five or less than 0.2, that's about 10% of the time, but on average, it comes from studies that have a sample size of 12. Uh, so extremely small studies. And almost always when we perform a replication effort, uh, a reproducibility check, and you study on the same question, the effect goes away. But typically, it just vanishes completely. Sometimes it becomes much, much smaller. Here's a focused example from emergency medicine, along with uh, Austin Parrish and some other colleagues from emergency medicine. We looked at all 431 meta-analysis that have been published uh, on emergency medicine interventions. And uh, there were over 3,000 studies uh, that had been uh, included in these meta-analysis. And this is the distribution of the effect sizes in the single studies and also in the meta-analysis. And, and you see that uh, it looks very close to normal distribution, uh, but there is heavy tails. And uh, what does it mean? It, it probably means that many, perhaps most of these interventions are probably not effective. Uh, and there is a share of interventions that seem to be effective. Now, the question is whether that share is really effective interventions or just manifestations of bias. Uh, and I think that there's both. There, there's some interventions that are effective and some other interventions that seem to be effective because of uh, bias results. Can we untangle the components of bias? Well, we can look at uh, risk of bias components. Uh, for example, if uh, we have uh, inadequate or unclear generation of uh, the randomization or of the allocation concealment process, or no blinding in randomized trials, we can look across multiple meta-analysis on multiple topics to see if these features are associated with the magnitude of the estimated treatment effect. And this is a, a large scale analysis of uh, multiple such meta-epidemiological assessments that we published. And we saw that for mortality, um, there was a subtle effect or no effect uh, but for 
other outcomes and especially for subjective outcomes, uh, there was very strong uh, pattern of association. So whenever we had some hint that something was wrong in the design of the study, then that uh, would tend to be associated with a much larger effect size estimate compared to studies that didn't have that design problem. But the problem here is that we could not really tell in any single meta-analysis that this is the exact correction that you should just correct the results for 20% or 40% or 60% of inflation, and then you would get a correct estimate because sometimes the bias may have tremendously affected the results and other times maybe it did not. So, so we could just see the average impact but not be able to disentangle in each single meta-analysis what that would mean. A lot of research is done increasingly in locations that didn't have a very strong tradition of research. And, and the question becomes then, as we kind of widen the spectrum of uh, institutions and researchers who can do research, can we expect that things will become better or might become worse? So we can have some empirical evidence by looking at the patterns of results in uh, studies that were done in countries that didn't have a strong tradition of research in the specific field, versus uh, others that were done in countries that had a strong tradition of research in this type of design. For example, randomized trials, uh, currently a vast number of them are done in China, in India, in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, in many low-income countries that didn't have uh, any strong tradition of, uh, of running randomized trials in the past. We did that for the entire Cochrane uh, database of all interventions in uh, medicine. And uh, we saw that uh, there was a pattern that uh, studies done in countries with uh, less uh, of a tradition of, uh, of clinical research tended to provide larger estimates of effects, uh, sometimes substantially so. Even for mortality, the average inflation was about 15%, which is huge because mortality effects tend to be very small. You know, 3%, 4% effect is, is amazing. You would save many, many lives, and the bias was... 15%. COVID changed things even further. Um, we have seen massive COVIDization of research. Uh, this is a, an analysis that we published uh, uh, last year, and uh, it has data until uh, about uh, August of 2021. And uh, we estimated that 720,000 authors published on COVID-19 in the scientific <laughs> literature. Uh, Every single scientific field, uh, we divided science into 170 field, 74 fields according to science metrics, uh, and every single scientific field had people working in it who published on COVID-19. The, the last field to fall was automobile engineering. Uh, until December of 2020, no automobile engineer had published on COVID-19. December 2020, even automobile engineering uh, had published on COVID-19. And uh, you see that uh, uh, that resulted in a, in a huge transformation of the odds of what is being published in the literature. Um, 98 of the top 100 cited papers in 2020 were COVID-19. Uh, 75 of the top 100 papers published in 2021 were related to COVID-19. Much of that research was done with haste Understandably, we had a major crisis and everyone had to uh, join forces and uh, we wanted all hands on, on deck, but multiple empirical studies have shown that actually COVID research was of worse quality compared to non-COVID research. And there's uh, comparative assessments of uh, COVID versus COVID-19. Obviously, the problem is how to match. Some people have tried to match uh, based on the same journal, for example, uh, it's understandable uh, that work was done very quickly. Sometimes corners were cut, but it came at a very critical time when uh, efforts were made to improve uh, uh, research in general. And it, it offered opportunities to, to improve research in general, but also offered opportunities to get things wrong. Uh, we saw a number of very prominent retractions, for example. This is probably the, the most well-known uh, paper in the Lancet uh, uh, on hydroxychloroquine, uh, supposedly including data from 371 centers around the world, but these centers had no clue that this research was being done. So apparently all these data uh, 
were fake. And uh, uh, the first author, who was a, a you know, very respectable professor at, at Harvard, had not even seen the data that uh, carried his name in the, the publication. So increasingly, many people say, we're not going to solve this problem unless we make raw data a prerequisite for publication, because otherwise we just have to put too much trust and even the best of us cannot really tell. Like, you know, one of the best Harvard professors could not tell that these data were entirely fake. He put his name on them. How can we do that? Well, many journals have done that for a while. Uh, for example, Nature Genetics uh, has uh, made availability of raw data a prerequisite for publication when it comes to microarray gene expression analysis, and uh, they have done that for almost two decades now, well, 15 years. So we, we paired uh, a number of microarray experts, and in coordination with Nature Genetics, we looked at 18 papers on microarray gene expression analysis. We tried to reproduce them, and uh, it could not be done. Uh, only two of the 18 could be reproduced and get the same results. The reasons for not being able to was that the data were not available, even though they were supposed to be. The software was homemade and it had disappeared. The methods were unclear, pretty much the same odds that uh, people in the cancer reproducibility uh, project uh, found, or everything was clear, but the result was different and uh, different microarray experts uh, and analysts would get different results based on the same data and the same methods. Here's another field, randomized uh, controlled trials. Uh, we tried to identify all the reanalysis that had been published, and we found uh, 37 eligible reanalysis of randomized trials that had been published. Uh, how many of them found different results compared to the original or made claims that they had found different results? 35%. 35% claimed that the results were different compared to the original. One would think that these people were rogue analysts or people who wanted to challenge the uh, original investigators, uh, but actually that was not the case. Most of the time, it was the original investigators who had authored or co-authored these papers. And the reason for this discrepancy is that in the current research environment, you cannot publish a reanalysis of your own paper again, unless you have to say that now I found something different, something new, something confusing, perhaps uh, much of the time. Uh, so probably this is just the tip of the iceberg. Probably there's many more reanalysis that have been silent, not visible in the literature, but uh, uh, who knows what the results might be. We have also seen that there is resistance to reputation. Uh, this is an early paper that I published in JAMA in 2007 with uh, Athena Tizioni and uh, Nikos Ponitsis, where we looked at uh, some very prominent examples of uh, papers that had been extremely heavily cited and then very clearly refuted by very large randomized trials. So we tried to see, do people continue to cite them? And, and they did. People continue to cite the refuted papers many, many years after the refutation. Actually, these papers were more heavily cited than typical papers published in the same journal in the same year. And the, the reason for the uh, continuation of the citation was not that they were claimed to be wrong. Uh, the refutations were either ignored uh, or they were attacked as, no, we continue to believe that this is uh, still the same. Uh, recently, we did a similar exercise in psychology, looking at four very prominent case studies that again have been squarely refuted. And we try to see whether there is belief correction versus perpetuation, whether there's citation balance versus citation bias, and explicit defense or no defense of the early observations. And we saw a very similar pattern to what we had seen in, in biomedicine. Uh, these are the studies that uh, have been extensively replicated. Uh, you can see that the replication efforts included typically uh, 20 to 100 times more participants compared to the original, and the replication effect sizes were as close to zero as anything can be. However, the original studies continue to be cited, continue to be heavily cited, and almost all of the citations were favorable with very little mention of the refuting evidence that was 100 times bigger and much better and much higher quality. It was just silenced, not mentioned, uh, and uh, people continue to cite what had been published in the original highly cited study. Uh, 
there's many fields that uh, are trying to make uh, sharing commonplace. Uh, this is uh, from a paper that we published in uh, Science a couple of years ago, along with colleagues working in uh, genomics. Uh, the, the common denominator of what we all believe is that when there has been public funding, these data should become widely available for everyone. Actually, we argued that the data should be shared before the investigators who produce them would have a chance to analyze. Because if they analyze them, they would be analyzing just a small slice of the evidence and that's very likely to lead to misleading results compared to just analyze the entire collection jointly and give credit to everyone, which would be much better powered, much better done, and much more likely to give more credible evidence eventually. In other fields, we have tried to unearth data that already have been collected and published, uh, especially from highly cited studies. Uh, these are the studies that are driving the field. So along with Tom Hardwick, uh, we made such an exercise to retrieve the raw data of the most highly cited papers in psychiatry and psychology. And uh, we reached out to the investigators of these papers, telling them that uh, we are willing to curate these databases and make them available for free. We don't want any funding from you. Don't worry, we'll take care of everything. We got some data sets, but relatively few. There were some more that were already available by their investigators, but the vast majority were not shared. And the reasons for not sharing, it was not really what we thought, that uh, researchers would still be using the data and would say that, well, I still want to work and get some more papers out of it before others uh, get a chance. Um, the key reason was that the data were outside of researchers' control. Uh, for example, it could be trials or studies that were sponsored by the industry, and the principal investigator had never seen the data. They, they had seen the analysis thereof, but the company still controlled the data. So un unless we could convince the company, we would not be able to, to get them. And then there were legal and ethical issues, for example, around informed consent, if the informed consent uh, was very clear that the data would not be shared. Uh, so I, I think that we have to revamp our whole experience about uh, how, who, and when uh, research is being done to be able to solve these problems. Here's uh, another uh, frontier effort uh, in randomized trials. The top medical journals uh, for the last four years have argued that we will not publish a paper unless we have a data sharing plan. So there has to be a statement that says what is going to happen with sharing the data. So we looked at whether this is happening and we looked at about 500 papers. Uh, most of the time there was some data sharing plan, but that data sharing plan only about half of the time said that the raw data will be available. Then only a minority would make these data available in a repository where you typically want to uh, get permission in order to use them. And if you asked, well, can I use the data right now? Can I just go somewhere, get the data and use them? Then out of these 500 trials, only two of them would allow their data to be used right away without any further permission and without any extra steps. Can we have trust under these circumstances? Uh, John Carlyle, who has been editor of Anesthesia, has uh, uh, coined the term zombie uh, trials. Uh, and this is uh, probably a message that we cannot have trust. So, so what did the, uh, John Carlyle do? Uh, as an editor, whenever he got a clinical trial submitted to the journal, he would ask the investigators to submit their own data so that that would be part of the review. And he would look at these data for very obvious problems. 40% of the time he found so obvious problems that he called these trials zombies. Uh, they were incompatible with these data being real or, or anywhere possible to be correct. So you, you would see data that had signatures of, of fraud or, or tremendous sloppiness. By extrapolation, when I wrote an editorial to accompany his experience uh, uh, in uh, a paper that was published on a Halloween date, or very appropriately, I estimated that if what he experienced is true across the board, then we have hundreds of thousands of zombie randomized trials circulating among us. Uh, and uh, the, the problem is who are the zombies and who are the real uh, trials and, and the real studies? To give a more positive message, uh, there are journals that are more transparent and more open. For example, BMJ and PLOS Medicine uh, 
and not only ask for a data statement, but they say that you really need to make your data available if someone asks for them. So we did go to the investigators who published there and we got about 50% of the raw data sent to us along with Floriano Debt. We reanalyzed these trials and all of the time we got the same results as the original investigators. There were some minor discrepancies, but none that would invalidate any of the key message of, uh, messages of the paper. So under the right circumstances and with an environment that is transparent and respects reproducibility, you can expect to get very trustworthy results rather than zombies. Are these environments becoming more common though? Maybe yes and maybe no. Uh, this is uh, an empirical evaluation of a random sample of the entire biomedical literature from 2000 to 2014. We saw that very little was being shared at that time. We repeated that exercise from 2015 to 2017. We saw some improvement. And then we repeated that exercise a few months ago. And uh, we used the entire open access uh, PubMed central database, as I mentioned before. We saw that there's clear improvement over time in data sharing, um, going from close to 0% in 2000 to something like 20, 25% in recent years. But we also noticed that there is a plateau in the last uh, four or five years that doesn't seem to need much of improvement. We saw very little action on code sharing, going from practically 0% to something like 1%, 2 3%. We saw some more action for protocol registration rising to a level of 5 to 6%. We saw far more improvement in conflict of interest disclosures and in funding disclosures. Uh, uh, and currently, it's the exception for a paper not to say something about conflicts of interest or funding. But then the issue is uh, whether really that disclosure is complete. And we saw that most papers continue to claim that what they do is something novel, but we also saw an increasing number of papers who admit or are happy or even proud to say that what they do is replication. Uh, this is looking at the overall results and the evolution over time. As you see, the worst performance has been for code sharing, just 1.2% over these 20 years. Data sharing is 8.9%, but uh, improving over time. And this is uh, looking at the same data uh, across the universe of science uh, using uh, that layout of science that uh, Kevin Boyack uh, has uh, generated. Uh, uh, each dot is one sub subdiscipline. And if you see color, it means that these uh, research practices are adhered in the papers published in that sub subdiscipline. You see that open access uh, broadly defined as uh, making uh, a paper available has become very popular. Uh, there's still a way to go, but, uh, but many papers are open access. Uh, this doesn't mean much though, because if you just have a paper, that's just an advertisement that research has been done. You don't have the raw data, you don't have the code, you don't have the details about what was done. Data sharing is highly concentrated in some research fields. Data sharing um, is better than code sharing that is concentrated in even fewer fields. And then you have these uh, other uh, layouts for uh, conflicts of interest, funding disclosures, and, and protocol registration. This is uh, showing the same data according to journals. And uh, you can see that there's very few journals where the majority of uh, the papers that they publish adhere to data sharing. Uh, it's, uh, it's only a couple among the thousand journals that are published uh, in science. Uh, code sharing, there's no journal that uh, code shares more than 50% of the articles that it publishes. Uh, conflicts of interest and funding are doing much, much better in protocol registration. There's few journals where more than 50% of uh, the papers uh, have uh, registered protocols. So we are still learning. And I, I think that uh, uh, we need to be careful not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, lots of problems have been identified. Lots of solutions are being proposed. Some of them are implemented more than others. Some of these solutions may actually be harmful. So we, we have to be very careful and, and use pretty high standards, especially if we want to change the way that research is done in large scale. I think that uh, there's increasing consensus that much of the action would probably need to happen at the level of the reward system. Uh, so we know that uh, productivity is highly valued, but we not need to look at also at quality of scientific work, reproducibility, sharing of data, translational impact, or what I call the PQRST. It sounds like an electrocardiogram uh, 
of, uh, of research practices. And we need to find metrics that evaluate these other dimensions beyond productivity, but also ways to reward people who do good science and also make sure that these metrics are not gained in the same way as productivity metrics are gained. Along with uh, uh, Danny Rice and David Moher, we looked at the promotion and tenure criteria and the recruitment criteria for 92 uh, biomedical faculties uh, around the world. And we saw that these new ideas are still not incorporated in faculty handbooks of these institutions. It's possible that they're discussed in promotion committees unofficially, but they're not part of the official agenda and the official faculty handbooks of, uh, of institutions. And uh, what we call non-traditional criteria, this kind of progressive criteria, um, are rarely used uh, in the official guidance to promotion or hiring or tenure, uh, even for the, the younger and lower level faculty like assistant professors. We also need to improve our research practices on how we get more reproducible and correct science. Uh, peer review, uh, for example, is a centerpiece of that. And uh, I'm a, a director of the International Congress in Peer Review and Scientific Publication that will be happening in Chicago in September. You're welcome to, to come. Uh, we, we, we just uh, closed the submission to abstracts, but uh, please do join us. I think that uh, we have lots of very interesting ideas that are being proposed and tested out with, uh, with preprints and post-publication peer review and grant proposal review and, and new methods and data science and artificial intelligence and new understanding of, of issues around how to evaluate science. To conclude, science has grown very big. We have about 200 million scholarly articles, uh, very large numbers of systematic reviews and meta-analysis thereof and an increasing amount of raw data that allows the conduct of empirical research on research. Transparency and reproducibility varies widely across fields and scientific applications. There's already signs of improvement across diverse fields, but with large heterogeneity across disciplines. Some disciplines may be reaching a plateau phase, even though there's plenty of room for improvement. And I think that reward system incentives may be key in improving what really matters. Uh, with many thanks to a number of my colleagues who uh, joined forces with me in some of the empirical work that I shared with you today. And with many thanks to all of you uh, for inviting me. So thank you, Professor Ioannidis, for this uh, very exciting talk. So now we're going to go to the Q and A session. So are there any questions from the audience or the Zoom? Yes, so Sebastian and then uh, Harry. Okay, I'm, I'm a student. Yeah. I, I, I was wondering with the, the issue of uh, meta analysis, how reliable they can be, because uh, you can see nowadays uh, two meta analysis on the same topic that give different results. That, that doesn't make any sense, right? <coughs> So, so can you trust them? Are meta analysis replicable? I, I think that meta analysis are, are uh, just a tool. And personally, I see them more as an opportunity to study bias. Most of the time, this is the best that we can hope to get from them. Uh, sometimes they may be helpful also to tell us about real uh, effects, but uh, we know that both the primary studies and the meta-analysis have their own biases. When it comes to interpretation, it's uh, far worse. Uh, for example, we have looked at 185 meta-analysis of antidepressants. And uh, when there was any industry involvement, uh, with one exception, there were no negative mentions about antidepressants. Uh, the, 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 50 plus uh, meta-analysis that had uh, an industry employee as um, a co-author, only one of them had any negative comment about antidepressants. So I'm not even sure that that person is still working for, for the industry. And so so I, I think meta-analysis have their own problems okay. and they have become very popular. Some of them are done with very suboptimal means with very little training. Uh, they're a topic to be investigated empirically on its own. <laughs> Yes, so Harry. Yeah, it's it's um, 
it's terrifying to be confronted with this amount of data on science, at least for somebody like me, whose uh, career has been spent studying science, but largely through uh, deep immersion in one or two field studies. Uh, and in particular, the one I'm most well known for is the uh, detection of gravitational waves. So I'm a sociologist who spent 45 years with the gravitational wave people watching how they did science. And uh, the your approach to science doesn't seem applicable to what they did in any way. For example, they finally announced to the world in 2016 that they had discovered, detected for the first time, a gravitational wave. Uh, they announced that after five months of investigating the vestigial signal uh, that was found, and which they believed after about two days, I should add. And I was, I was watching them all the time. And I believed it after two days as well. And then they spent five months doing various statistical analysis and getting the statistical analysis to a level of five sigma, which was the criterion for publishing in physical review letters as a discovery, which they finally made it to. Uh, it, it required a, a slight retrospective change of method in the statistics, which they felt very, very guilty about, but decided that they could live with it. And uh, out it went. And it was much to my astonishment, actually, widely accepted. Almost nobody rejected it, except for one group uh, in a, a very competent scientists in the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen, who reanalyzed some of the data and concluded that the result was false. And I thought, well, that's exciting for a sociologist. I'll, I'll follow this up. And I did follow it up, but I didn't follow it up for very long because I felt that the Niels Bohr people weren't really understanding what was going on. Now, the problem for a field like gravitational wave detection, or shit, let's say high energy physics, is that all the experts and all the experts in analyzing the data are within the field. The paper that they published was had 1,250 authors or something like that. And that's typical of high energy physics. And, you know, peer review is difficult because all the experts are in the field. So what they do is they set up their own red and blue teams to argue against each other, to try and get a kind of artificial peer review out of it. <clears throat> so what I would say on their behalf is opening their data to uh, a wider body of examiners would be disastrous because nobody else out there understands how to analyze it. And um, I saw one, I mean, I've been saying this for years, that in fact, if you, if you read the scientific literature, if you came from another planet and you tried to learn terrestrial science by reading the scientific literature, you'd get it completely wrong partly because of some of the things that you say, that most of, the, most of the scientific literature isn't read by anybody anyway. How do you know what to read? Well, you gather in these small trusting groups. Uh, you've got far, far, far too much to read if you want to read everything on your topic. So you say, well, I'm going to read that paper and that paper because it's got some credibility. I know somebody who says we ought to have a look at it. And, you know, it goes like that. But to open it, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, I said that there was this perfect counterexample. I read it in The Atlantic, actually, the other day. I stumbled across it. It was a study of the of ivermectin, uh, the efficacy of ivermectin on, on the pandemic. And what they pointed out, <clears throat> they pointed out the things that I've just pointed out, that most of the scientific literature isn't read. But the trouble is, the further out you extend the body of legitimate readers, the more incompetent people you've got reading the literature. In the case of ivermectin, of course, the whole thing went out on social media. So you've got the <clears throat> locus of legitimate interpretation, as I call it, went out to everybody who knew nothing about 
medicine at all. And you've got a disaster that ivermectin was counted among the population of warriors about the pandemic as an effective medicine, backing up President Trump, of course. So how does your approach fit with this approach? Very, very, very interesting. Um, so the, the physics example that, that you mentioned is um, pretty much a situation where there is open data sharing because all of these 150 or 500 or 1,000 physicists who publish in that field, they have access to, to the data. So, you know, you have the, the people who are knowledgeable uh, and, you know, you can crystallize what is the, the boundaries of being knowledgeable, being an expert in the field. All of them, they have access to the data. I mean, if, you know, if they want to look at them themselves, they can do that. And as you say, they have the red and blue teams uh, competing. Sometimes they may have multiple teams analyzing the data in parallel and then comparing notes. I mean, we do that in, in genetics. We typically have two or three teams that independently look at the same data set. And then we compare notes to see and there's always a little bit of discrepancy. But then we say, OK, well, that step was not fully defined. And if we define it, then we, we agree completely. I think that that would be very nice if, if we could have implemented in other fields, because in, in most biomedical fields, um, these 150 or 500 or 3,000 experts, uh, each of them publishes their own paper, and no one else can see these data that, that they have published. It's not that they share all their data and they share uh, their analysis or they perform their analysis jointly. Each of them is using their own private data to publish something, and then others use their own private data to publish something else, and, and it's very, very confusing. I agree that if you expand to like the whole world, and we saw that with COVID, uh, unfortunately, in very large scale, <laughs> I mean, you, you would have everyone becoming an expert and everyone uh, you know, becoming a guideline developer and insisting that they know uh, the whole truth uh, 100% and uh, that's exactly what needs to be done. Uh, so so there, is, there is probably some right solution. I'm, I'm not sure how exactly you define uh, an expert, you know, a card carrying expert that you need to have these credentials to be able to, to do this. I think every field can, can sort it out more or less, uh, and uh, say that, uh, well, you need to, to know at least that much to be able to touch these data because otherwise it's going to be problematic. In, in the COVID example, though, it was not that all these people were analyzing data. They were analyzing tweets. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, the, the, the data never became available. Um, people just commented on tweets and blogs and Facebook and uh, TikTok. And uh, <laughs> so, so, so some sort of parascience uh, was built around the science and, and that shadowed the science. It, it, it was far bigger than, than science, which was far more limited. And in the case of ivermectin, you know, these studies were small with very limited data, couldn't really do more than uh, tentative statements at best. Uh, but, but then it took a bigger life on its own. And I, I think that this is what we need to avoid. I, th I think that transparency with availability of data and reproducibility options within the knowledgeable community would be good. Most of the, of the Twitter players would not be able to touch these data. They, you know, they would not have the capacity. Some of them might. I mean, I've, I've seen that, especially with COVID-19. Some people who came you know, from physics, for example, to try to analyze epidemiology, and goodness, it, it, it was a disaster. Again, you know, probably worse than the Twitter disasters because these people were scientists, you know, but they just had no clue what you know modeling that they were performing. Okay, can, can I just respond to that, Chairman? Yeah, uh, very, very quickly. We are running out yeah. of time. I, oh, so, so I, I want to get something very positive quickly. out of our little interchange, and I want to say so that you would agree with me that before you can do the kind of meta-analysis approach or whatever approach it is, which involves opening data, you have to agree where the boundaries of the expert community lie. So you can say whether it's become too wide. I, I think it's it's very useful to have, but I'm- And that's, I'm, I'm, and, 
Yeah, and that's going to vary from science to science. Yeah, yeah, but I'm adding an asterisk that there will be some some border warfare <laughs> on on, on 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 who is eligible and, and who is not. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Professor Ioannidis, for the exciting talk and the very exciting discussion. So 